Well, good evening. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church, and this is our Good Friday service. Sooner or later, we all come across the age-old question. Why does a loving God allow evil in the world? Or perhaps the question would be, why does God allow evil people to live? You know, like Hitler or Putin. Why doesn't God just give them a heart attack? If God is all loving and if God is all knowing, why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? If God is all powerful, why doesn't he just do something about all the suffering in the world? Those are good questions, sort of. And I'm sure someone you know or someone you love has asked this question, hoping maybe that you could answer. You know, since the war began this year, I know a lot of people have been wrestling with the question of evil. Certainly, it seems like some of the things we've heard about in the news or seen on TV uh, are shocking and easily defined as being evil. But see, here's the thing. A person who asks the question, how does a loving God allow evil in the world? When they say the word evil, they're thinking about people like Hitler and drug dealers or Pol Pot or uh, Idi Amin. In other words, evil is always someone else. I mean, couldn't God get rid of all the evil people instantly? Well, of course he could. But then we would need to define the parameters. What is evil? How evil? How wicked? Where's the bar? Is it mass murder? Is that evil? Or is it genocide? What if it were just one murder? What about rape? What about child abuse? What about adultery? Or theft? Or lying? What is evil? What is wickedness? Of course God could wipe out all of the evil in the world, but if he did that, there'd be none of us left. You see, we define evil as always being someone else. And it's never me. Evil is always other people, other countries, other belief systems, but never mine. Proverbs 6 says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wickedness. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Revelation says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers and the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. First Timothy says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Why does God allow evil? Evil by whose standards? Mine or God's? God defines evil very differently in these verses, doesn't he? Selfishness, anger, unforgiveness, untruthfulness, faithlessness. But most of us, we see evil as being a, a gray area. I mean, sure, there's evil, but then there's evil, evil. Okay, but God doesn't see a gray area. 1 John 1 says, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. There is no gray area. God is 100% light. No darkness. He is perfect. He is flawless. Evil, as defined by God, is any percent of sin, any percent of wickedness, any percent of evil. There's no gray area. So where does that leave us? Well, Romans 3 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. 
right? All. How does a loving God allow evil in the world? Well, I'll tell you this much. He allows me in the world. And I have to be grateful for it. Well, I mean, I have my moments, but I wouldn't say I was evil. I would. Blaise Pascal said, humans are the glory and the scum of the universe. Maybe you don't call it evil with a capital E. We'll just say that, well, I, you know, I, I have an honesty problem. Or maybe you don't feel remorse. Or you rarely, you rarely forgive people. You're still holding a grudge. You're a manipulator, and you're good at it. You know how to say just the right thing with your words to win the argument every time. You don't take responsibility for your mistakes. You don't apologize. You're a bad friend. You belittle others. You interrupt people. You never express appreciation. You roll your eyes when other people talk. You're sarcastic. You love correcting people. And if you do have to apologize ever, you fake it and it's insecure. Well, that's not evil, Pastor David. That's just, that's just being human. Ecclesiastes 7 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would offer that we need to stop throwing Hitler's name around as the poster child for evil. When with just our words, hurtful words directed at another person, at a waitress who got our order wrong, you're stupid and you're worthless, we could crush another person. Or maybe it's with the absence of words. A brother we have not spoken to in years, our own flesh and blood, we've ignored. We live our life as if they don't exist. To be honest, I am so glad that God does not erase all of the evil people in the world. Because I am one of them. And now as a culture, right, as a society, we mock God. We mock God, we deny that he exists. We allow sin to grow in the world more and more. We allow immorality to grow in the world. We allow to, the world to slowly edge God out of life more and more. We allow all kinds of filth into our minds through music and television, through entertainment. We're not only evil, we're rebellious. We're disobedient. How can a loving God allow evil? That is not the question. No, that is not the question for Good Friday. The question for Good Friday is, how can a righteous God be loving to rebellious sinners who have earned his wrath? This is what the wrath of God looks like. Ezekiel 25, I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am the Lord and I lay my vengeance upon them. Romans 1, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. How does a holy and perfect God allow sinners into his presence? How does the scum of the universe get into heaven? Well, it's a good thing you're here tonight because that's the question that Good Friday answers. If you are to understand the cross, you have to wrestle with that question. How is sinful you righteous before a holy God? And God is holy God. He is holy God. He is just judge. The Bible says in Proverbs, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Do you know what that means? It's about justice. It means if a judge tells a guilty person that they can go free, that is an abomination, right? That is not justice. Likewise, if a judge sends an innocent person to jail, 
well, then they're incompetent and they're crooked, right? The Bible says God punishes sinners and sends those people to hell. But the Bible then asks, well, how can God be just and right and holy and at the same time send sinners into perfect heaven? That's the bigger question. Look at King David, Israel's greatest king. A man whom God says was a man after his own heart. King David was a liar, he was an adulterer, he was a murderer. And he was confronted. In Samuel 12, he is confronted by his own court advisor. Nathan says to David, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil? In his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites, and therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. David royally messed up. Royally messed up, and Nathan just lays into him. Now watch David totally get exactly what's coming to him. Watch David get what he deserves. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin and you shall not die. What? Huh? Forgiven. Forgiven, just like that. That is not justice. Any judge today would have stripped him of his crown, right? The media would have had a field day with him, gone to prison. Do you see what pardoning a sinner does to God's character? A just judge cannot be good. A just judge cannot send people away without punishment. A a just judge has to punish. There has to be accountability or else he's not just. But God seems to enjoy setting people free. God seems to enjoy forgiving people. But that is a threat to his character. How can God be holy and just and perfect and at the same time allow us into heaven? And that's the dilemma. A loving God cannot be good. A good God would punish evil. A good judge would condemn evil. And this is the first part of understanding Good Friday. You know, we, we, like to, we like to look at the cross and we, we, we say, this, this was for me, right? We say, Christ died for me, and he did. But can I add chiefly, Jesus died for God. Jesus died for God. Jesus died to satisfy God's wrath. God's righteous anger, God's judgment. Jesus died so that God could be loving and good. In Matthew 26, it says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to the, and be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said not during the feast, 
lest there be an uproar among the people. We always read these passages and we think about the, the machine that is put in motion to have Jesus arrested and be killed, but make, make no mistake, no human entity set these wheels in motion. It was God's design from the big, very beginning. The cross has always been God's plan. When Jesus died on the cross, he did that for God's glory. And it was to fulfill a need. It was to satisfy a wrong. It was purposeful. The cross was actually good news to God before it was ever good news to you. Jesus had to die to appease God's wrath. Jesus had to die so that a wrong world could be corrected. Everything Jesus ever did was God-centered. And that includes dying on the cross. At his trial, Jesus could have name-dropped. He could have demonstrated his full power. But instead, the Bible says, Jesus remains silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That is chilling, chilling. Because Jesus basically says, one day, I'm going to be sitting in that chair. Our places will be reversed. But rather than be cut to the core, right? Rather than the high priest to fall on his face and apologize for offending the Lord of creation. Verse 65 says that the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. And they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Jesus, sentenced to death by his own creation. Judged by people that he made. And, and, and not only that, but they're his own people. These are fellow Hebrews, people that should have known better. The Romans, I mean, later you'll see the Romans try everything they can to get out of this mess. Pilate says, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of these two do you want me to release for you? And they shouted, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. How can we even be this far into Matthew and not see the absolute horror of these events? This, this Jesus is the baby in the manger. This is, as John says, the God-man in flesh. He is the one who spoke and taught these same crowds with authority. He is the one who healed the sick. He is the one that opened the eyes of the blind. This is the same man. And now the crowds are all shouting for his execution. Verse 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeled before him and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. I can't even paint a picture for you of how gruesome and how horrible this is because there was nothing like it on the planet. One of the reasons why Rome was such a force of its day was because they had mastered the art of torture and war and death. They were, they were one of the most advanced 
intellectual, cultured races on the planet, but at the same time, they were one of the most cruel and most barbaric. But this entire scene, this entire chapter is horrific. This entire chapter is wicked. This entire chapter is evil. I mean, first, because Jesus is betrayed by one of his friends. How does a loving God allow a betrayer into his inner circle? Jesus calls Judas to be a disciple, knowing full well that he would be the one who betrayed him. Jesus' arrest was wicked. His trial and the lies spoken about him at his trial were wicked. The courts were crooked. And now he's beaten. It's all evil. Ladies and gentlemen, it was all evil. This is the evil that God allows to exist in the world. And it doesn't even end there. Even after Jesus is nailed to the cross, his punishment doesn't end. The, the Bible says the people in the crowd, they continue to shout at him. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. It's ridic ridiculed, made fun of, jeered at, adding insult to injury. And where are the disciples? The men whom he loved? The men who he poured into for three years? He invested in friendship, in relationship with them? Where are they? Run off. They've run away. John was there. His mother Mary was there. Mary Magdalene was there. The rest of his friends had all abandoned him. They were afraid. And they couldn't even stand with him in this hour. Do you ever wonder what you would have done in this scene or where you would have been or if you were to look at all the characters that are in this story, like where you'd picture yourself and say, oh, well, I'm that person or I would be that person? Heratius Bonar wrote a hymn titled, Twas I That Did It. Because when Heratius asked the question of himself, if I had been there, where would I have stood? Who do, who do I identify with in the story? He was honest. And he said, you know what? I would have just been in the crowd. The crowd of people going along with it, doing what everybody else was doing, not sticking out. Crowd justice, crowd mentality. He said, me, I would have just been blindly doing what everyone else was doing. He writes in his hymn, I see the crowd in Pilate's hall. I mark their wrathful mien. Their shouts of crucify a pall with blasphemy between. And all of that shouting multitude, I feel that I am one. And in that din of voices rude, I recognize my own. I see the scourges tear his back. I see the piercing crown. And of that crowd who smite and mock, I feel that I am one. Around yon cross, the throng I see, mocking the sufferers groan. Yet still my voice, it seems to be as if I mocked alone. T'was I that shed that sacred blood. I nailed him to the tree. I crucified the Christ of God. I joined the mockery. Yet not the less that blood avails to cleanse away my sin, and not the less that cross prevails to give me peace within. How does a perfect, holy God forgive wickedness? and evil. Three things. Because Jesus was our substitute. That's the only way. How do I know Christianity is the right religion and all others are false? Simple. Every other religion is about reaching up towards God 
and trying harder and harder and harder to better myself and to grab the reward. Only Christianity is about a loving God who comes down. If there is a God and he made all things, then God is creator and father. And as a father, a father would do anything a loving parent would do. A loving parent would do anything, anything for their children. How does a perfect, holy God forgive wickedness and evil? Simple. He came to be our substitute, and he took our punishment, and he died our death. 2 Corinthians 5 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was our substitute, and he was our propitiation. 1 John 2, 2 uses this word. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What is, what is that? What is, that's a big word, propitiation. What does that mean? It, it means appeasing. It means Jesus allows us to be in good favor again with God. We would not be in God's grace if it wasn't for what Jesus did. You see, without Jesus appeasing God, you and I would be left to suffer God's wrath. And we would do that alone. This is what the Bible says about God's wrath. Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel said to me, take my hand, this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. And when they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword. I will send among them so I took the cup of the Lord's hand and I made all the nations to whom he sent me drink it. Habakkuk says, you will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourself drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. Psalms, for a cup is in the hand of the Lord and the wine foams, it is well mixed and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down to its dregs. This cup is God's wrath. This cup that we all deserve to drink. When the disciples ask Jesus, in heaven, can one of us sit on your left and one of us sit on your right? What does Jesus say? He says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink. And they said to him, we are able. What's the cup that he is about to drink? The wrath of God. In Matthew 26, Jesus prays in the garden the night of his arrest. Then Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What is, what is the cup? Do, do you think Jesus is afraid of soldiers? Do you think Jesus is afraid of being whipped and punished? That he's afraid of being mocked? Do you think he's afraid of being nailed to a tree? No. Jesus is being asked to be spared from the full, brute force of the wrath of God. On Good Friday, Jesus drinks the cup down to the bottom, down to the dregs. He took it all so that peace could be made, so that God was appeased, so that the relationship would be restored. Jesus took the full wrath of the Father so that we would never know the wrath so that we would only know a loving father. You and I are now friends of God because Jesus is our reconciliation. Matthew 27, verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders heard it, saying, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. 
And Jesus cried out again, and with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. You know, a lot of people have their own thoughts about why Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? Because it almost sounds like a question, like it's coming from Jesus' own lips, that maybe he's confused. Not at all. Jesus is being tortured, and he's dying, but he's not confused. In fact, he is still clear of mind. And even in this moment, he has not stopped teaching. That line that he gives is from the book of Psalms. It's Psalms 22. It's the first line of Psalms 22. And speaking it would make anyone who knew that psalm remember what that psalm was about. Even in his last hour, he is teaching from the cross. Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melts within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones, and they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. You read this, and you say, surely Psalm 22 is about Jesus, right? No! This was written 600 years before Jesus. Psalm 22 was written before crucifixion was ever invented. But it mysteriously describes the details. Piercing, hands and feet, bones being out of joint. In the Gospel of John, it says blood and water flow out from where the spear stabs Jesus, meaning that he had fluid buildup in the cavity around his heart, meaning that he would have died from a heart attack. This matches Psalm 22's description, saying my heart has turned to wax. The Hebrew word in Psalm 22 for pierced literally means that it was punctured like a lion. In other words, his hands and feet are mutilated. Did God inspire Old Testament prophets hundreds of years prior to Jesus' life to predict details of his death so that we would know that all of this was according to plan? And then Jesus quotes that psalm from the cross as a way of putting God's signature right over the top of all of it. Jesus says on Good Friday, no human did this. No human could have predicted these events would have taken place. When he cries out, Jesus is not asking a question. He, he is not confused. No, but rather, disciples are gone. His body is broken. He is bleeding. He is cut off from God. He is taking the full wrath of God, and he is still teaching, and he is still fulfilling prophecy. And then what happens? Verse 51 says, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what had took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. It's reconciliation. The cross of Christ gave hell-deserving people, wicked people, another chance. No more curtain in the temple. That means no more barriers, no more walls, no more separation, no more division. No, no more God on one side, you on the other side. That barrier was torn in half. 
Jesus bore our punishment and he removed the separation. He drank the full cup of God's wrath so that you and I would only know a loving God and we would never know a wrathful God. How does a loving God allow evil in the world? Short answer is he doesn't. So the cross resolves it. Romans 5 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here we can clearly see that the cross of Christ is the demonstration of God's love for people who are not perfect, people who are clearly broken, clearly wicked, evil, sinners. The cross is not a demonstration of God's love for the deserving. No, the cross is a demonstration of God's love for the undeserving. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. That's why we call Good Friday good. because it is the cross of Christ that sets us free and that restores the relationship. It is the cross of Christ that takes away the wrath of God. It is the cross of Christ that makes God and us friends and family once again. It is the cross of Christ that answers the question, how does a just and holy and perfect God allow broken and undeserved sinners into his presence. It is because of the cross of Christ. As we leave and end our time together for this Good Friday moment, I hope that you carry this with you through the weekend. Because this makes Easter all the more. We first have to walk through the cross in order to get to the resurrection. It is this weight that we carry, this weight that we feel. And if you feel that, if you're wanting some sort of resolution, I promise you it's coming, but it's not coming today. We have to be in this moment. We have to sit in this moment first, just like the disciples who at this moment are in hiding. They are in fear and they are sad. It's okay to mourn on Good Friday. It's okay to cry when you think about the cross. Yes, Easter is coming, but just not today. But this is why Good Friday is good. Let me pray for you. Lord, when we have our communion services, we always pause and thank you for the cross. We pause and we thank you for the flesh and blood of your Son that was given for us to set us free. And it seems like such a happy time to take communion. But we seem to steer away from the sorrow and sadness that a Good Friday sermon might bring. The cross is still wicked as much as it is beautiful. It still describes a horror as much as it describes a salvation. And Lord, as we sit here now on Good Friday, just days before Easter, the tension within us grows and we want a resolution. And even though we know a resolution is coming, it's just not coming today. 
Lord, as we sit with this and we wrestle with the cross and perhaps we wrestle with our own darkness and our own sin, remind us that it is not born all over again, that you are not crucified every single time we sin, that, Lord, that that is all paid for in the past, that we are reconciled right now, that we are seen as holy right now, that we are seen as your children right now, that each one has the opportunity to receive all the benefits of the cross right now. And Lord, if there is anyone that has not yet received Christ, Lord, we just pray that you would motivate them to attend an Easter service near them, that they would be able to hear the gospel message proclaimed, that they would be able to receive you as Savior and be welcomed into a community who will love them and nurture them as they grow as your disciple. Thank you for giving us this moment where we can reflect on the cross and reflect on the need for the cross in our own lives. Thank you that you are both just and good, that you are both righteous and loving, that you are perfect and yet you allow me to be your friend. May I only see the cross as beautiful. May I only see the cross as being the answer to all my questions. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Amen. And thank you for hanging out with me in this moment. Thank you for taking this time to reflect on the cross with me. I invite you back uh, on Easter. Uh, At our church, we have three services. We have one at 7 a.m. It'll be down at the Yacht Club flagpole lakeside. Um, Bring a lawn chair if you want, bring a blanket. Uh, We're gonna have a beautiful hour uh, of singing and uh, talking about the resurrection. And then we'll have two services back here at the church, one at 9.30 and then one at 11. And uh, we'll have a full children's program for both hours. We'll have an Easter egg hunt for all the kids at both hours. And we would love to have you come. We'd love to have you be here and to just share in the wonder and the splendor and the glory of Easter. And if I don't see you until then, may you have a blessed Easter. He is risen. And he is risen indeed.